This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. everyone to the Castle Lifestyle and Medicine Health Center. Tonight, as part of our Healing Foods Forum, we would like to present a gentleman who is considered one of the nation's foremost educators in vegetarian nutrition. He's taught dietetics and nutrition at the college and university level since 1980. Having served as a faculty member at Florida State University, Broward Community College, and Miami-Dade Community College. At the latter institution, he created the nation's first credit program in vegetarian studies. As a registered dietitian, he's worked at Miami Children's Hospital, Wesley Woods Nursing Home in Atlanta, and several public health agencies in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. He's lectured at national and international nutrition conferences and has written articles for such periodicals as the Journal of Nutrition Education, Vegetarian Times, and Vegetarian Voice. He was one of the founding members and the first chairman-elect of the Vegetarian Nutrition Practice Group of the American Dietetic Association. Association. In 1993, he was induced into the Vegetarian Hall of Fame by the North American Vegetarian Society. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce to you George Eisman. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for coming on this wet Hawaiian evening. I, I, I've been doing uh, talks like this for about the past seven months. This is, I think, the 95th talk I've given. I've been on a national speaking tour on behalf of an organization called Farm Sanctuary, which is a group that has a farm in New York State, and I also have one in California. Um, they're, they're similar to a humane society, except instead of taking care of dogs and cats, they take care of cows and pigs and chickens and sheep that get abandoned or neglected or don't make it to the killing floor in a slaughterhouse and they wind up taking care of them, letting them live out their natural life. And they have several hundred animals that they take, take care of at each of their shelters. They were, they've been upset the past, uh, about the past seven or eight years because the meat consumption in this country had been going down for a while in the mid-1990s and now it's started to go back up and they're very upset because they get more animals to take care of. The more animals that are raised, the more chances there are of some animals being falling through the cracks and and getting into their charge and they also have a lot of members that want to be more vegetarian but are being put on these low carb diets like the Atkins diet by their physicians or by friends or whoever telling them this is the way to be healthy and the way to lose weight that's an alarming thing especially for a person like myself who's not just a vegetarian but also a dietitian because it's not a healthy way to eat and most people don't understand why it's not a healthy way to eat and that's what I'm, I'm out here talking to the, to the public about. How many of you know somebody that's on a, a low-carb diet or the Atkins diet and gives you a hard time? Okay, it's out there. The first edition of the Atkins book, Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution, came out in 1972 when I was an undergraduate in college. And it was, a few people lost weight on it, but basically it was kind of put aside as a typical diet book put out there by someone who didn't know the basics of nutrition, which unfortunately most medical doctors don't. Most half the medical schools in the country don't have any, medi any, any nutrition courses at all. The other half have one. And, and dietitians take lots of nutrition courses, and yet it's diet books written by doctors that people tend to, to pay attention to and to look at and, and to follow. That was in 1972. In 1993, something happened in this country that was very significant from a, from a food standpoint. In 1993, what happened was that the USDA, which is charged with um, prom uh, promoting 
good nutrition among the American population, but basically is also charged with selling the produce of American agriculture. The USDA finally took down the old four food groups. Everybody remember the old four food groups, which are there since the early 1950s till 1993. In 1993, the evidence was so overwhelming that the four food groups were causing a lot of problems. The four food groups had the meat group and the dairy group on top. Of course, they were always the most important. And then they had the fruit and vegetable group and the bread and cereal group as the, as the sort of minor groups, with the idea being at least half the foods that you eat ought to come from animal products. The evidence was so overwhelming by, actually by the late 1970s, that Americans were dying by the hundreds of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands of diseases related to eating too much animal fat, also animal protein and too little fiber, which only comes from plant foods. So the idea of having animal products as at least half of your diet was, was faulty. And so finally in 1993, the USDA finally gave in. In 1977, actually, the Department of Health and Human Services was so upset that the USDA wouldn't change the four food groups, they came out with their own set of dietary guidelines telling Americans to eat less fat, eat more fruits and vegetables, and so on. That was 1977. By 1993, the US, USDA was basically shamed into saying, okay, I guess it's time to take down the four food groups, which when I went to school, they were like the four commandments that, you know, that's what you told people to eat. But by 1993, USDA said, okay, well, it's time for a change, so they created the USDA food pyramid, which has as its base, and the base of the food pyramid is the bread and cereal group, instead of just two or three servings a day, six to 11 servings a day from the bread and cereal group, and then above that, larger groups of fruits and vegetables separately, because they're both important, instead of just two or three servings a day of fruits and vegetables, three or four or five servings a day of fruits, and same of vegetables, and then above that, the smaller groups, instead of the meat group, you now had the protein group, which included beans and nuts and seeds, and the dairy group still stood by itself because of their strong lobby, but it was a smaller looking group. And then at the top of the pyramid, you had things like fats and sweets as optional groups that if you were going to eat them, eat them sparingly. The old four food groups didn't even address things like fats and sweets so that if you ate from all the food groups, you could have as many hot fudge sundaes for dessert as you wanted to. It didn't matter. And that's why all the professors of nutrition when I went to school were all very obese because they had their four food groups and lots of dessert besides. So. The food pyramid was a way to, to avoid these dietary excesses, especially getting away from the excess animal fat, animal protein, and to try to promote more fiber. Unfortunately, the USDA didn't make a distinction between refined and unrefined carbohydrate foods. You had the bread and cereal group at the bottom, but they had pictures of things like white bread and white rice and white pasta and even things like donuts and cookies because they're made from grains as part of your bread and cereal group. And then in the fruit group, you had things like juices and, and fruit snacks and fruit roll-ups. As long as it was made with real fruit, it was part of your fruit group. And in the vegetable group, you had refined vegetable products like fruit, like V8 and tomato juice and ketchup could count as your vegetable group. So that there were people were eating a more of a plant-based diet, but it was based on refined plant foods. Refined means the fiber has been removed. When you take a, 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 a grain and you remove the outer bran part of it, you're taking away the fiber and also a lot of the vitamins and minerals. You also remove the germ, which has a lot of the fat soluble vitamins. So you, you're refining a, a grain, you refine fruit by, by squeezing out the sugar basically, by squeezing out the juice or just refining the sugar out of it. And the same thing with vegetables. If you take the fiber away from the vegetable, you're losing a lot of the good nutrition part of it. And so when people started following this food pyramid, they weren't following it the way it should have been followed, which is to focus on the whole plant foods. They were focusing on refined plant foods. And what the problem is when you eat refined carbohydrates, which is what the carbohydrates are sugars and starches that come basically from plant foods. And when they're refined, when the fiber is removed, the effects on the body are, are not really good. They're not good in the sense that all sugars and starches ultimately get reduced to sugar, to, to glucose in the blood, and they raise your blood sugar. But they'll raise your blood sugar slowly if the fiber is there to slow it down. Fiber acts like, kind of like an envelope around each molecule of sugar and starch so that your body can't digest it very quickly. If you eat a whole fruit, generally your, your blood sugar goes up very slowly. But if you squeeze out all the, just the juice and you get the, the sugar over here and you leave the fiber over here and you just consume the, the sugar part of it or the carbohydrate part of it without the fiber to protect it, then your blood sugar shoots up very quickly as though you've just had a spoonful of sugar because there's nothing to slow down the absorption to your bloodstream of that glucose. And the same thing happens with grain products. Even though they're starches, starch is just a long chain of glucose molecules. And your body can digest that long chain of glucose molecules and that starch molecule very quickly. We have enzymes right in our mouth called salivary amylase 
amylose is another name for starch. And you can, if you take a piece of white bread, hold it in your mouth for a few seconds, it'll turn sweet because your, your enzymes in your saliva are turning that into sugar. And so when you eat refined grain products, you get a rush of blood sugar, just like you had that, that fruit juice or just like you had refined sugar. So unless you're having whole grain products, you're getting this rush of blood sugar just like you had refined fruits. And what happens when your blood sugar goes up very quickly like that is that it becomes a crisis situation for the body. Your body doesn't want to have high blood sugar. And the reason for that is because when your blood sugar is high, your, your blood sort of becomes syrupy thick, like maple syrup. And when that blood is trying to go through the little capillaries in your body, it tends to sludge and slow down, and the sugar tends to crystallize out against the walls of the capillary. The capillary is made out of protein, and you get what's called glycosylated proteins, where the, the glucose actually attaches to the protein, and it becomes hard, kind of like rock candy, forming on the inside of your capillaries. And so when a surge of blood tries to get through those capillaries, instead of being nice and elastic, like a rubber band, like, like capillaries normally are, those sugar crystals tend to make the capillary walls hard, and when, the, when a surge of blood tries to get through when, when you're under stress, when your blood pressure is high, then those capillaries tend to burst. And the smallest capillaries in your body are in your eyes and in your kidneys and in your toes. So if you have uncontrolled high blood sugar, you tend to lose your vision, and you lose your kidney function, and you, lose your, you have, often have to have your toes, your feet, your whole legs amputated. Anybody with uncontrolled diabetes will tell you that. So it's not a good situation. So you don't want your blood sugar high. So your pancreas will secrete this hormone called insulin to drive your blood sugar back down. And when your blood sugar is really high, it'll always secrete too much and force it down too low. And when it forces it down too low, you get a condition known as low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. Anybody here ever get low blood sugar? What are the symptoms of you having low blood sugar? You get, you get kind of weak and shaky and irritable, and you also get hungry. So what happened? You just ate all this refined carbohydrate food that the government's telling you to eat, and a half hour later, you're hungry again. So you're eating some more. This is when people say they're addicted to carbohydrates or they have sugar addiction. It's not that they're addicted to it. It's that it's gone from their bloodstream so quickly that their brain is saying, what happened to my sugar? And it's making them hungry again because your blood sugar is low. And the reason your blood sugar gets low like that is because what the, what the insulin tells every cell in the body, we've got all this sugar in the blood. You've got to get that sugar out of the blood. You take it into the cells and you turn, either burn it for energy, which we usually don't need to because we're lazy, we're not burning that much energy, or it, it turns the sugar into fat, a type of fat called triglycerides. So if you're eating this diet according to the food pyramid, lots of refined carbohydrates, drives your blood sugar up, now your blood sugar's down again, you're going to eat again, so you're going to overeat, you're going to have high and low blood sugars, you're going to have high levels of triglycerides in your blood building up. And what happens in a lot of people if you're at all genetically prone to diabetes, is after a while, when, those cell, when your cells of your body become clogged with this fat, they, the next time your blood sugar gets high and your pancreas sends out some insulin, the cells tend to ignore the message of the insulin. It says, well, I'm too clogged up with fat. I'm not going to bother taking any more sugar. I'm going to leave it in the blood. This is what's called insulin resistance. This is type 2 diabetes. You, you have insulin, but your cells resist it. And the pancreas gets upset and says, well, oh, we can't have this, and pushes out more insulin, trying to drive that sugar into the, into the cells. And that drives up your blood pressure because it's trying to push that sugar into the bloodstream. So what happens when you, when you eat a diet high in refined carbohydrates is you tend to overeat. Your blood pressure goes up. Your blood sugar goes up. Your triglycerides go up. And when you overeat carbohydrates, you tend to put the weight on around your midsection because carbohydrates to the body are good fuel. The body wants to run on carbohydrates. And it figures if you're overeating carbohydrates, there must be a good crop of something coming in out there. And you're eating a lot of it because there's a famine coming or a hurricane or something's coming where there's not going to be food later. So it's going to store it up and store it in your midsection and keep your arms and legs nice and slim so you can keep going out and gathering more of this good food. When you overeat fats, which are not good food, you put your body, body weight on your arms and legs. Your body tries to slow you down so you don't, don't keep eating this stuff. But when it's, when it's good carbohydrates, you put your weight on around the middle. And so in 1993, this food pyramid came out. And in 1998, the head of the nutrition department at Stanford Medical Center in California, he noticed he had a lot of patients coming into his clinic that were getting fat around the middle, getting high blood sugars, high blood pressure, high insulin levels in their blood high levels of triglycerides, and he called this cluster of symptoms Syndrome X, and it sounded very sinister. And he wrote an article about it in a medical journal, and he got letters back from clinics all over the country saying, we've got lots of people with this cluster of symptoms also. And they had a conference, and they changed the name to Metabolic Syndrome. It's estimated now that 45 to 55 million Americans have Metabolic Syndrome. 
people paid attention to that food pyramid, started eating all those refined grains and refined fruit products and vegetable products, and were getting this, this cluster of symptoms, which is very, very dangerous to health. Sometimes the first symptom you actually feel, besides getting fat around the middle, the first symptom is a heart attack. So you don't want to fool around. So if you've got a clinic and you have people coming in, you say, we've got to put people on a diet. What do we do? We've got to get people off carbohydrates. That was the simple solution. We need to find a low-carbohydrate diet to put people on to get them off this, this high, refined carbohydrate diet. Being medical doctors, not nutritionists, they didn't think, well, it's the wrong kind of carbohydrates. They just thought it's carbohydrates causing the problem, which it was. So they looked around for a, a low-carbohydrate diet, and of course, Dr. Atkins raised his hand and said, I've had one out for 25 years. Everybody's been ignoring me. And sure enough, now 30 million Americans have been put on the Atkins diet. I mean, Dr. Atkins, you know, he had a gold mine there because, because of that food pyramid and some other factors that happened. One of the other factors that happened was that in the mid-1990s, when people started eating according to the food pyramid, the meat consumption in this country went down. This is what I was talking about at the beginning. And people like Farm Sanctuary were very happy. People were eating a lot less meat. But the problem was the far, all those farmers in the Midwest that raised a lot of cows and pigs, they raised a lot of corn to feed those animals. And they were all of a sudden not selling as much meat, so they had a whole lot of corn left over they didn't know what to do with. So they asked the government for a subsidy. And the government subsidized them to develop something called high fructose corn syrup. They took the sugar out of this corn, they squeezed it out, they made this syrup, and the food industry loved it because high fructose corn syrup is sweeter than sugar, and because it was subsidized, it was much cheaper than sugar. The sugar cane farmers out here hated it, let me tell you. So the food industry, every Coke, every Pepsi, every processed food out there that was using any significant amount of sugar switched over to high fructose corn syrup, and the American consumption of high fructose corn syrup went up by over 1,000% in the last 10 years. Now, the problem with high fructose corn syrup, fructose is a natural sugar in fruits, which we can handle in small amounts, but in large amounts like we were getting in our food supply, all of a sudden, they, all the body can do with large amounts of fructose like that is send it right to the liver, and the liver turns that fructose right into triglycerides. So that was adding to this problem, because having high triglycerides is not a good thing. So you're turning this sugar right into fat, and the problem is that it bypasses that high and low blood sugar thing. It never gets turned into glucose, which teases the brain. The brain, brain cells and some nerve cells, uh, some of the brain cells can only run on glucose. They can only run on sugar. They can't run on fat at all. And when the brain thinks it's getting something sweet, but it doesn't get it at all. Remember, when the blood sugar goes down, the brain gets upset, but at least it got it for a little while. With this fructose, this high fructose corn syrup, the brain never gets any glucose at all. And it really, make, it really gets upset and really makes you hungrier. It's the same principle as, actual, as actually as artificial sweeteners. You know, when you use an artificial sweetener like, uh, you know, what's, what's out there now, saccharin and cyclamates and things like that, artificial sweeteners were never approved as a weight loss aid. No, most people don't know that. I mean, Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi, that's the biggest scam put upon the American public. They were only approved for diabetics to use as something sweet because they couldn't have sugar. They were never approved for weight loss. As a matter of fact, every study ever done with artificial sweeteners shows that if you give half the room artificial sweetener and the other half the room sugar and then let them go up to the buffet table, the ones that got the artificial sweetener will always eat more. They'll always eat a bigger meal total, including the sugar that they, they would have eaten because the brain thought it was getting something sweet. It was thought it was getting its, its glucose. It didn't get it. Your appetite went up. So they actually increase your appetite. And this high fructose corn syrup works the same way, except that those artificial sweeteners didn't have any calories. High fructose corn syrup has the same amount of calories as sugar does, and it's making you hungrier. So that, that's the worst stuff out there, and that was making the problem even worse by making people even hungrier and getting their triglyceride levels even higher. And so that combination of factors really led to this situation where the Atkins diet and these low-carb diets really do work because it gets people off that high and low blood sugar cycle, gets them off that high fructose corn syrup, and lets their appetite regulate itself, let, gets their brain away from this idea of, you know, I, I got something sweet. How come I'm still hungry? How come I still have no fuel to run on? As a matter of fact, the dairy industry did a, a study, I think about six months ago, where they, they came out with this notion, this conclusion, that, that drinking a glass of milk every morning helps children lose weight. You know that study was done? The, half, the, half the group of children had breakfast with a glass of milk. The other ones had breakfast with a Coke with high fructose corn syrup. So that's why those kids didn't gain as much weight. Okay, and the dairy industry knew what's going on. So 
that's, that's the scene of why we have all these people on this diet. Now, why is this diet not a healthy diet? Well, if you know the basics of human nutrition, which is what uh, I'm out here teaching people, because most people don't know the basics of what our bodies run on. Most people know more about what to feed their dog or their cat than what to feed themselves or their children. We just they don't learn the basics of human nutrition in, in this country, in most developed countries, because the food industry wants to sell us every food they can think of, and the diet book industry wants to sell us every diet that comes down the pike, and the pharmaceutical industry wants to sell us every drug to, to help us get better when we eat the wrong foods. The basics of human nutrition are that our bodies run well on carbohydrates. Sugars and starches, when we burn carbohydrates in our bodies, the only waste products that our bodies have to deal with are carbon dioxide, which is where the carbo comes from. Carbon dioxide, which we just breathe out. And hydrate means what? Water. And water, which we just urinate out. So when you burn carbohydrates in your body, all you have to do is breathe and go to the bathroom and the waste products are taken care of. When you burn anything else, you've got other waste products to deal with. The only other, the fuels that our bodies can burn are carbohydrates, fats, protein, and alcohol, ethanol alcohol. You drink ethanol alcohol, your body will burn it for calories, but all, what, you do, what your body does with it after it kills some brain cells is it sends it to the liver, the liver turns into fat, you get a fatty liver, and then you're burning fat. So that's, that's what you do with alcohol. With, with fat, when you burn fats in your body, and do, this is what the Atkins diet, the other low-carb diets are. They're basically high-fat diets. And when you're burning fat in your body, you have in, first, first you start trying to burn the fat, and things are okay for a little while, but the brain wants to run on sugar. The brain doesn't want, like to run on fat. But after a while, if all you have is fat to burn, the brain sends this message to the metabolic pathways in the body and says, if all you're going to do is burn fat, I can't run on fat, but if you, if you burn the fat, Partially, you get these intermediate breakdown products called ketones. Ketones are three different groups of chemicals, one of which is acetone, which is nail polish remover and paint thinner. It's pretty nasty stuff. But there are brain cells that will run on some of these things for a short time, and, and they will build up in the body, and the brain, the brain will be temporarily happy, but it isn't completely happy. So it slows everything down. Your brain says, if you're going to make me run on ketones, I'm going to slow everything down, including your appetite, because I don't want to keep running on these things, so I'm going to make sure that you don't keep eating this stuff. So it actually suppresses your appetite to have these ketones building up in your body. And that's the other way that these diets work, is by basically poisoning your, your brain into slowing everything down, including your appetite, because your brain doesn't know the difference between the fat that you're eating in your diet and the fat that you've been saving up for this famine that's coming. So the, your brain is taking the kind of the conservative way out and thinking, well, is if you're actually burning up your fat stores, I'm going to slow everything down, including your appetite, so you're not wasting your energy running around looking for food out there if there isn't any. You would have fed me good food if there wasn't any. So it assumes there isn't any food out there, so it slows down your appetite. So you basically stop eating or stop eating very much. And that's how these, that's the other way these diets work. And in the ultimate sense, your body's also being kind to you because if you really are going to starve to death, at least you're not going to die hungry. And people that go on hunger strikes and these long fasts will tell you after the first two or three days they don't, they're not hungry anymore because their bodies basically adjust and it, and it actually forces their brains into a different relaxation state where, where hunger is just not an issue anymore. And it's a nice thing. After a while, bad things are going to happen in your body. And the reason they, they happen is the same reason why we switched from the four food groups to the food pyramid because all that fat that people were eating was causing things like heart disease and strokes and cancer are three leading causes of death. And that's what happens in your body when it's forced to run on fat for a long period of time. For a short period of time, you get some weight loss, and that's a good thing. But in the, lo in the long run, running your body on fats, clogging your, your, your arteries and your, your capillaries with fats is not any better than clogging them up with those sugars. And even in the Atkins book, he says that when you go on this diet for two weeks, you're going to be basically cleaning yourself out and losing weight, and you're eating a very low-carbohydrate diet. When you start adding carbohydrates back to your diet, because your brain is going to crave those sugars, you have to really cut down on your fats, otherwise they're going to stay around and clog up your arteries and cause heart disease and strokes and cancer. And people have gotten heart attacks and strokes on the Atkins diet, and when they try to sue the Atkins Corporation, they don't win, because it's actually in the book that you have to cut down on your fats as you go, go on with the diet, especially when your weight starts to level off. Most people don't read that far. This is not a diet for life. It's just a temporary weight loss diet. But you can achieve the same thing just by getting the fiber back into your diet, just by going back 
to eating whole grains and whole fruits and vegetables, you could achieve the same weight loss. And every study that's been done on the Atkins diet shows that you get the same weight loss on a, on a good, healthy diet. A plant-based diet, as you do on the Atkins diet, after a year, the weight loss is basically the same. You lose it faster on the Atkins diet because you're losing a lot of water weight and because your appetite is suppressed that much more in the beginning. Calorie restriction is calorie restriction, and you wind up losing the same amount of weight. But your body will be healthier at the end of that time. Up until now, the longest-term study done on the Atkins diet has been a one-year study. And most of these diseases, like heart disease and strokes and cancers, take 10, 15 years to develop. And last year, the government of this country got upset because they realized there's 30 million people on this diet, and if our heart disease and cancer and stroke rates go up because of this, who's going to foot the bill for a lot of that? They're going to have to do it. So they decided last year that they wanted to do a long-term study on this diet to see if it was safe. Now, if there had been a drug out there for 30 years, and all of a sudden the government says, let's do a long-term study to see if it's safe, people would be going nuts. But it's a diet. It's protected by freedom of speech. So they didn't have to prove that it was safe, but the government wanted to know that it was safe. But the government didn't want to pay for the study, so they asked who would do the study for free, and the Atkins Corporation raised their hand and said, we'll, we'll do the study for free. So the Atkins Corporation has been commissioned to do a long-term study on their own diet. And so in 10 or 15 years, we'll see a, a report come out from the Atkins Corporation in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Health showing whether or not this diet is safe in the long term, whether these people that go on this diet have higher death rates from chronic disease. And the, the reason that the the results won't be as accurate as they should be is because in 1999, Atkins came out with a new edition of his book. Instead of Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution, it's now Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution. It was such a good revolution, why well, didn't he need a new one? But he, he did a lot of homework in those 25 years, and he changed the diet quite a bit. The basic premise of the diet is still wrong. The basic premise of the diet being a low-carb diet, although if you look at the ads they have now, it's no, no longer talking about being a low-carb diet. It says this is the diet that will teach you how to eat the right kind of carbohydrates which is the right thing to do. But basically the idea to lower your carbohydrate intake is not the right thing, but there's enough other things about the diet that he's changed that will make it a healthier diet than a typical American diet, that, which is focused on things like low-fat Twinkies and low-fat Triscuits and things like that, which are not healthy foods either. And that's, that's what the diet's going to be compared to. And if you look at the changes in the, in the Atkins diet now, first of all, he requires everybody on his diet to eat three cups of green vegetables every day, three cups of leafy green vegetables, at least two cups of raw green vegetables and another cup of either raw or cooked green vegetables. Now, green, leafy green vegetables are the healthiest thing on the planet for human beings, bar none. They're full of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients to fight cancer and heart disease and things like that. So he knows if he gets his people to eat three cups of greens every day, and the control group is going to be like most Americans, not eating three cups of greens in a month, maybe not even in a year, some people not even in a lifetime, really three cups of kale and broccoli and things like that. There's a lot of restaurants in this country that run out of broccoli every night now. Because all the people on the Atkins diet order broccoli instead of their french fries or baked potato. That's a good thing. But it's not what, that's what's making the diet healthier, not the pork rinds and the bacon and things like that that are the basis of the diet. So three cups of greens every day is important. Everybody can do that. Another thing on his diet is you have, you're supposed to drink eight glasses of water every day, eight eight-ounce glasses of water, a half gallon of water every day. And that's important. It's important to keep your body fully hydrated. It helps with a lot of disease resistance. But it also helps suppress your appetite. When you're fully hydrated, you're much less likely to overeat. If you're thirsty on a hot day, if you're thirsty, you might feel like having an ice cream. But if you take a glass, big glass of water, a lot of that craving goes away. And you tend to eat less at a meal if you're, if you're fully hydrated. So that's an important thing to be fully hydrated. On his diet, you're not allowed to have any caffeine. No coffee, no tea, no chocolate. You can have some decaffeinated coffee, some herbal teas, but it doesn't count towards your eight glasses of water every day. He wants to make, because caffeine's a diuretic, so he wants to make sure whatever, you're not washing out any of that water, and if you're drinking something else, it doesn't count. Keep drinking the water. It's a very important thing to do. Another thing on, on the Atkins diet is you can have a, hot, a lot of fat of almost any type, except there's one type of fat you can't have any of. Anybody know what that is? Right. Uh, the trans fats. The worst type of fat out there is something called trans fats, which are hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated fats. And... If you look at any of those Atkins bars and things that they sell, they have, there's, there's not very much good about them, but the one good thing about them is there are no trans fats in them. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of other foods now that are taking the trans fats out of their recipes because the Atkins people won't buy them. And there was a study that came out in 1999, a big nurses' health study out of Harvard, where they studied about 50,000 nurses there. 
and they looked at all the dietary factors that, that these people ate and didn't eat and their risk of, of heart disease and other chronic diseases. And the number one dietary risk factor for predicting uh, heart disease, uh, heart attack was intake of trans fats, more so than anything else. So based on that, the government has, has actually said that the safe human intake for trans fats is zero. We're not supposed to have any of these things in our diet. These are hydrogenated fats. They take the unsaturated oils, vegetable oils, and they force hydrogen onto the structure of the fatty acid so that they turn hard. They, become, they turn unsaturated fats into saturated fats, which means it'll raise your risk of heart disease and strokes. But because it becomes an unnatural configuration, when that gets into your cell membrane, it also causes carcinogenic changes. So you, you have the worst type of fat you can imagine in the food supply, and trans fats are in 40% of the foods you'll find in a typical supermarket. I mean, they're in everything. They're in crackers and cookies and breads and things like that. And Atkins knew enough to get these things out of the diet of, of his people. So when they do a long-term study, that's going to make that diet look a lot better than people. Even if the other group is eating low-fat Twinkies and things, the low-fat is still mostly trans fats. These trans fats, because they have this structure that makes them very hard and resistant to breakdown. It gives foods a long shelf life, sometimes gives them a shelf life approaching infinity so that you can, you can have these food products sitting on a shelf forever. The food industry loves using them, but they're not healthy for us at all. And Atkins recognized that. He got them out of the diet of his people. So we can all do that. The government has actually mandated that by the year 2006, you think I'm going to say they have to be taken out of foods. No, this is this government we're talking about. By the year 2006, all foods have to be labeled with the amount of trans fats in them. It's probably not going to be a warning label saying how bad it is for you, just so you can compare this food with one gram to this food with three grams of trans fats. Right now, they'll tell you how many, how many grams of saturated fat, unsaturated, total fat, but they won't tell you how many grams of trans fats. All you can do now is look on the label and see if it's made with hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats and that those are what you want to avoid. But the Atkins people know trans fats and these things are, should be zero. And that's one thing that makes the diet much better than the typical weight loss diet people are drinking. Now, the other thing on the Atkins diet that you're not allowed to have any of is, and most people are surprised by this, on the Atkins diet, you're not, you're not allowed to drink any milk. Anybody know that? No milk. You can have all the butter you want. You can have cream. You can have some cheese, but no liquid milk. Now, he says the reason for this is that milk has sugar in it. Uh, not that it's put in it, but there's natural sugar called lactose in milk. And that's, he says, you don't want to have any sugar in your diet. Well, lactose doesn't really raise your blood sugar very much, so that's not the real reason. One of the reasons is that over half the adults in the world are lactose intolerant, which means that they don't digest this sugar very well, and you get digestive disorders. You get cramping, you get bloating, you get diarrhea from drinking a glass of milk. A lot of people who are lactose intolerant don't know it. And you go on the Atkins diet, you're eating crummy foods, but you're not drinking your milk with it. All of a sudden, you start feeling better after your meals. You say, oh, this is a wonderful diet. I feel better. It's not because you're eating bacon and pork rinds. It's because you're not drinking that glass of milk, which you couldn't digest very well. So that's one thing that makes people feel better on this diet. But there's another reason. It's a little bit more insidious, or, or I should say ingenious on his part. There's, there's, a, there's a very strong theory that that because all the milk we drink in this country now, at least most milk that people drink, is homogenized. Everybody remember the old days when you bought a bottle of milk and the cream would rise to the top and you'd have to shake it up? About around in the 50s and 60s, it became widespread to homogenize all the milk, which means they take the fat, the butter fat that's in the milk, and they emulsify the fat in such small droplets that that fat will never separate in that carton of milk. It will never separate. It gives it a shelf life of infinity, basically, as far as the fat goes. And there's a strong theory that when we drink that homogenized milk, those tiny fat droplets have a hard time getting cleared from our system, and those fat droplets tend to attach to the walls of the arteries and start that atherosclerotic plaque that leads to heart disease. That was a theory that was out a long time ago. So actually, the, the process they use to homogenize milk is very similar to the process they use to hydrogenate the fats. And both, both those processes became widespread at the same time. And they were both invented around 1899. These processes were both invented homogenization and hydrogenation. In 1899, they were invented. You know, what, you know what year, as far as I've read this book, that talked about you know, the process and, and human health, and it said that the first actual death reported to be attributed to a heart attack was in 1912. In the 1920s, it was still a very rare disease, and it was only in the 1940s, 1950s that it took off being our number one killer. 
And what happened? We started using homogenized milk and hydrogenated fats, using Crisco shortening, using uh, margarine, and drinking milk as adults, and this homogenized milk, and all of a sudden, heart attacks just took off. And Atkins is smart enough to have read that history and said, if I can get hydrogenated fats and homogenized milk out of my people's diets, I'm going to lower their heart attack risk. And everybody's going to think I'm a genius because I'm putting them on a low-carb diet. It's not the low-carb. It's those, those, those fats that our bodies have a really hard time getting rid of. So that's what we can all do. I mean, dairy products, if you think about it, are the most ridiculous things for adults to be using. I mean, there's no other species of animal. I mean, if we went somewhere and we saw an adult animal of one species nursing on the udders of another animal, we'd see, you know, if there was a gorilla nursing on an antelope, we'd say, what's going on? I mean, you can see if you took the baby, if the mother gorilla couldn't feed her baby and stole a little milk from the antelope's udder, you'd say, well, that's pretty clever. But for the adult gorilla to be down there sucking on that that mother antelopes udders to get some milk, we'd say, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why, why would one adult animal have to drink the milk meant for the baby, the infant species of another animal? And it is, I mean, the whole idea of, of using milk as an adult food makes absolutely no sense at all. And, you know, the, our, our health, the statistics, when you look at the health statistics, the relationship between dairy products and, and health, especially the hormone-related cancers, is just off the charts. The, the men that drink the most milk have more than a 70% higher risk of getting prostate cancer than the men that drink the least milk. And with cheese, cheese really concentrates those hormones. The men that eat the most cheese have a 90% higher risk of getting testicular cancer, which is another hormone-related cancer, than the men that eat the least amount of cheese. If you think about it, all the cows that are milked in this country now are milked while they are pregnant. They, they take the, this female calf, basically. They impregnate her. She has her first calf. As soon as that calf is born, it's taken away to the veal farm, she's immediately impregnated again. It's all artificially inseminated. And then she's milked. So the whole time she's being milked, she's pregnant with a calf. She thinks she's feeding that calf that just got taken away, trying to get that calf to grow up fast enough so there'll be enough milk for that new calf that's going to be coming. Imagine how many growth hormones she's trying to push out into that milk to get that calf to grow up that fast. And plus, on top of that, now they give cows this bovine growth hormone to make them produce even more milk. The amount of hormones put out in that milk is just ridiculous. And we're not growing anymore. When we're adults, I mean, children are growing. As adults, we stop growing this way, we're going to grow this way, or we're going to grow tumors. And that's, you know, that's what we've learned from these years of, of, of eating uh, dairy products as, as adults. I mean, you know, things like cheese potentially could be good foods in times of, of famine and, you know, where there's not enough food around. But if you look around, populations of the world that eat the highest fat diets have the most hormone-related, highest hormone-related cancer rates. And even if you look at the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet is only recommended, which is a lot of olive oil in it. It's only recommended for people when their weight is normal. When they're overweight, that diet is not a recommended diet. So you have to get your weight normalized before you can eat even the good fats. We need to eat a lower fat diet in order to get our bodies healthy. Okay, the, the other thing on the Atkins diet that's a good thing is he recommends his people use organically grown foods whenever possible. And that's a clever thing because all the pesticides and even organically raised animals have, they're not given all these hormones. All the pesticides that are used on plants, all the hormones that are given to these animals, they're basically known carcinogens in, in, in excess in the body, especially the pesticides. So he knows if he can get people to use more organically grown things, their cancer rate is going to be lower in the long term than the people using traditional stuff. So that's, that's, that's a good thing we should all be doing. The, the other thing that Atkins recommends highly when you go on his diet, well, it's not a diet, it's the Atkins nutritional approach, he, where you have to exercise every day, a half hour of exercise, which is important for your heart health as well as for suppressing your appetite. But he says, before you go on this plan, go to your physician, tell your physician you're going on a weight loss plan and an exercise plan, and you want to get off all medications that will, that will mitigate against your losing weight. And there are a lot of medications out there that are very commonly prescribed that, that do that. Things like antihypertensives, things to free, control your blood pressure, things that control your blood sugar, antidepressants, antiarthritis medications like Vioxx that just got taken off the market that encouraged your body to accumulate fat and caused heart disease. I mean, things like aspirin lower your risk of heart disease. Something like Vioxx, which the drug companies just made up so, because the patent ran out on aspirin, so they needed to make more money on something and this stuff is giving people heart attacks. The blood sugar medications that give the oral things, when your blood sugar's high and you go to the doctor, he says, well, I can give you something orally to try to get your blood sugar down. You know how those things work? 
Remember how the, the cells of the body become resistant to the insulin? They don't want to take in that blood sugar anymore. These medications force the cells to take that sugar in. And what do they do with it? They turn it into fat. They clog, they, and you can get fatter. When, when you had your high blood sugar, at least some of that sugar was spilling into your urine, you were losing those calories. Now your body's being forced to hold on to those things, so you gain weight, you raise your fat levels, it raises your risk of heart disease, but at least your blood sugar levels are lower. Temporarily it helps, but in the long term it makes you sicker, it makes you fatter, and you know, Atkins is smart. Atkins, he's written books about alternative ways to treat disease and alternative, and he, he at least, because he made his money from diet books and not from prescribing pharmaceuticals that have bad side effects, he knows that there are things out there that are keeping people overweight, and so that's one of the reasons why his diet also does work, is because he gets people to reevaluate their medications, go to your doctor and tell them you want to lower your medications, get off of them, or have some er herbal alternative that'll have the same effect without the side effects. So those are, you know, those are some of the things that make his diet not as bad as it really ought to be. Now, what's, what's bad about the diet, obviously, is that it's a high-fat diet, and that fat clogs up your arteries, causing heart disease and strokes, which are artery-clogging diseases, raises your risk of cancer. Now, cancer is a disease. I mentioned these hormones, but any, any high-fat diet um, tends to sludge the immune system so that if you have a cancer started somewhere, the antibodies you need to fight that cancer have a hard, harder time getting there. So any high-fat diet is something you don't want to have if you want to lower your risk of cancer, which is our number two killer. Heart disease and strokes are number one and number three. So you don't want a high-fat diet for those reasons. Now, what about protein? Most people have this idea that fat might be bad, but protein, there's nothing wrong with eating a high-protein diet. Well, Atkins says right in his book, you know, this is, this is a fairly high-protein diet, but it's not an unlimited amount of protein. Because when you overeat protein, what most people don't realize is your body doesn't actually ever burn protein for calories. It, it uses it for calories, but it doesn't burn it as protein. It takes each amino acid, the protein's made up of amino acids, and it breaks them up into amino acids, and circulates them in the blood, and a certain amount of them you use to build your muscles and your enzymes and things like that. And all the excess protein that you ate that you didn't need for that, and were, you don't really need very much for that, all the excess protein, the amino acids, are sent to the liver, and the liver pulls, takes the amino acids apart. It deaminates them. It pulls the ammonia, which is what makes it an amino acid, pulls the ammonia off of it, and the rest of that amino acid, depending on which amino acid it is, is either just a chunk of fat or a chunk of sugar. And that's what it burns. So it isn't really burning protein, it's burning fat and sugar that it gets from the excess amino acids that you ate. So about 60% of the amino acids get turned into sugars, the other 40% get turned into fat, and that's how you're burning them. And because 60% get turned into sugar, those will raise your blood sugar levels and raise your insulin levels. So that's why Atkins limits your protein intake. It's not a high, an unlimitedly high protein diet, or else your blood sugar will go up and you'll have that same problem. So you can eat all the fat you want, and your protein is limited to, he says, to 150 grams a day, which is a lot, but it's not unlimited. It's not really that much. Most Americans eat about 110, 120 grams a day anyway. So you don't want to over, you can't overdo protein on it. But when you overdo protein, when you do eat a lot of protein, what your body, besides having all that fat and sugar that you wind up with burning, it's that ammonia that causes the problem. The ammonia that you're pulling off of these amino acids, that ammonia floods the liver. The liver is flooded with ammonia, which is pretty nasty stuff after a high-protein meal. The liver has to work hard to get rid of that ammonia, and when it does, it turns it into a urea, sends that urea to the kidneys. The kidneys have to work real hard. They get swollen with fluid to dilute that urea, and then they get rid of the urea into the urine. In the meantime, all those amino acids turned your blood slightly acidic, and in order to buffer that acid, the body had to borrow some calcium from your bones to buffer that acid. So, and when the kidneys get rid of the urea, they also get rid of that calcium that you borrowed. So by eating too much protein, you've stressed, you've stressed the liver, you've stressed the kidneys, and you've stolen from some calcium from your bones, all to get, to get this sugar and fat from them. It's a pretty wasteful process, pretty taxing process in the body. So there's no, no real reason to eat a lot, of, a lot of protein. Now, Atkins says on the first page of his book that if you have kidney disease, you cannot go on this diet because I allow too much protein because too much protein taxes the kidneys. If you have a kidney problem, that's no good. If you look at countries where they eat a lot of protein, kidney failure is among the leading causes of death. Peoples of the North, the, as we just call the Eskimo peoples, the Inuit peoples, their leading cause of death is kidney failure from eating all that fish protein. They have a very high rate of osteoporosis from all that, all that uh, 
that calcium being washed out of their bones. So eating a lot of protein just creates a whole other set of problems that eating a lot of fat, you know, doesn't. And there's actually there's issues, things like milk protein. The casein, which is in cow's milk, actually raises your cholesterol levels without any fat being present in the milk. Just pure skim milk will raise your cholesterol levels because of the casein, which is the protein in, in the milk. So there's, there's, not a, there's nothing good about running their body on protein. There's a lot of problems with it. And you, you need some protein. The amount of protein that you need to run your body is very minimal. The, the original studies done showed that the adult human need for protein is only about 15 to 20 grams of protein a day. That's the minimum human need for protein. 15 for a typical size adult woman, about 20 for the typical size adult man. That's really all your body needs. Now the recommended daily allowance, which this government recommends, they take the minimum need, they double it, they add a little margin for safety, and the recommended daily allowance for women is 44 grams of protein a day. For men, it's 56 grams of protein a day. In Europe, they recommend all adults get no more than 40 grams a day. We're a little bit more liberal in this country. But most Americans are eating 110, 120 grams a day, much more than the recommended allowance, which is much more than what the minimum need was. We don't need that much protein. The original studies done that showed that you lose calcium on a high-protein diet showed that when your protein intake was more than 90 grams a day, you, couldn't keep, you can't keep calcium in your bones. You're always going to lose more in your urine than you're going to keep in your bones. So you don't want to go above 90. 44 to 56 is plenty. That's the recommended allowance. And we're all, you know, we're all way, way higher than that. We don't need to be. And if you want to keep your kidneys in good functioning order, if you want to keep your bones healthy, you, you really want to keep your protein intake below 90 grams a day. Atkins says keep it below 150. But, you know, and he talks about how, you know, there have been some studies that show, well, you can, you can have higher amounts of protein without losing too much calcium from your bones, but all those studies were actually sponsored by the Dairy Council and by the meat industry. There hasn't been any unbiased study that shows that you don't lose calcium on a high-protein diet. So, the, actually, the original studies were done at the University of Wisconsin in the middle of, you know, the big dairy state that showed that you lose calcium on a high-protein diet. So, you don't want too much protein. You don't want too much fat. You don't want too much alcohol. The only thing your body can run cleanly on is carbohydrates. All, all your body deals does, has to deal with on a high-carbohydrate diet is carbon dioxide and water. No ketones, no fat clogging you up, no ammonia, no urea, no loss of calcium. That's why your body likes to run on carbohydrates. Whenever you eat enough carbohydrate, your body will not burn the fats and the proteins. and let, they'll, they'll just sort of stay around and cause problems. They will burn, I mean, they'll break them down, but the fats tend to accumulate when you have those carbohydrates there because the carbohydrates are what the body wants to burn. And that's what that Atkins recognizes that, and that's why he tells you, you know, as, on his diet, you start out with 20 grams of carbohydrates a day, which is the three cups of greens. And every two weeks, every week, you add five or 10 grams back to that. And as you're doing it, you have to cut down on your fats in order to keep them from sticking around. Your body wants to run on carbohydrates. And the, the problem is, over the years, is that you need a little bit of fat in your diet. You need these essential fatty acids, just a tiny bit. You need some protein for your essential amino acids. You don't really need any alcohol, or some people argue about that. You don't need any carbohydrate, technically. Carbohydrates are not essential nutrients. You will not die of a carbohydrate deficiency. It's not like a vitamin or even the protein. You don't need any. You just, by default, it's the only clean burning fuel that we have that doesn't cause a problem. So. Over the years, low-carb diets have been around for 100 years because people have recognized that all your body does with carbohydrates is use them for fuel, use them as calories. So you could say, well, they're empty calories. Well, then they're empty in the sense that there's nothing else your body does with them, but they're clean calories, and that's why we want to burn them. But that's why they could get away with putting you on a low-carbohydrate diet because you're not going to die of a deficiency of anything. What's going to kill you is burning the wrong fuel. Whatever else you're burning instead is going to cause some problem down the line. And that's what people have to recognize is that you sure you can eat a low-carbohydrate diet and be okay. People say, well, see, I, I, I'm, I told you this is a good diet. Look, I'm not eating any carbohydrates. I'm not getting sick. Well, yeah, because you don't need the carbohydrates, but what's going to make you sick is having these other things accumulate in your body over the years. They're chronic diseases that take years to develop. They're not, it's not like having a vitamin deficiency where your you know, gums bleed and your teeth fall out. So it's not like you know, something that's going to click right away, but you are going to have problems in the long run by burning fats or burning protein and having those waste products build up. You know, people come to me all the time and say, you know, I, you know I've, I've got this disease, or, you know, it's, 
you know, what, what can I do about it? And I say, well, maybe it's, you know, from what you're eating. And they say, well, it couldn't be. I've been eating this way all my life. I say, yeah, that's the problem. You've been eating this way all your life. And now it's finally caught up with you. But people expect, you know, uh, people think it's like an allergy or something, that they'll get a, get a problem right away if they're eating the wrong foods. But it isn't. It's something that takes years and years to develop. And, you know, Mother Nature tries to provide for us in times of shortage by letting us survive on almost anything for, you know, short periods of time, even relatively long periods of time. But if you want to extend your life to what it should be and not be sick, I mean, sometimes I, you know, I'm appalled. I go out and I look at what people are eating in fast food places and in supermarkets, and I say, well, how do people survive on this stuff? And then I go into the drugstore and I see all those pharmaceuticals that people are buying, and that's what's holding us together. And then you see all the, the health care costs that we have, and astronomical, and we have, you know, ex-presidents having bypass surgeries, and, you know, sports athletes dying in their, in their 40s and their 50s. You know, they think these people are paradig- paragons of health. You know, the leading cause of death among bodybuilders in this country is kidney failure. Taking all those protein powders, they don't need that. I mean, if, if taking protein made you build muscle, you know, we could all, you know, eat a steak right now and tomorrow morning we'd look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But it doesn't happen. We don't just turn protein into muscle. You have to exercise to build it up. All that excess protein causes problems. The extra, extra protein that you're eating each day, you know, stresses your kidneys a little bit, stresses your bones a little bit, stresses your liver a little bit. But it's a cumulative effect meal after meal, year after year, decade after decade, before any problem is, is going to present itself. You mentioned the problems with trans fats as is, uh, elevators of cholesterol. Do you have any information about the effect they have when they get into cell membranes? Because they do. They right. can get taken into the cell membranes. As far right. as I know, there's no research. Right. Well, in, right. I mean, the, the, the idea is that when they get into the cell membrane, the, the cells don't the cells don't function as well as far as being able to resist disease and especially resist carcinogens. There, there's a good, there's a book called Trans Fats that I think I can, I can look up the reference for you, but I'm going to talk about fish. Um, yeah, uh, fish, you know, they're an animal product. They have the same amount of cholesterol as other, other meats do. They have no fiber. There's a, they're high protein food and of course they concentrate environmental toxins. I mean, mercury and other heavy metals are in there. You know, fish is a healthy food. If you're eating a diet that's very high in land animals, if you're eating a diet that's high in beef and pork and things like that, eating some fish helps balance the fat levels in your body. And what I mean by that is fish is mostly unsaturated fat, which is liquids at room temperature, whereas uh, land animals tend to be saturated fat. And, you know, you kind of, you want to have a balance between the two. You want to have very little of each one. But what fish does, principal fatty acids in fish are what are called omega-3 fatty acids, which are the the unsaturated fatty acids. They're unsaturated because there's a place along the carbon chain where there are hydrogen atoms missing. That's why hydrogenation replaces those. There's a place along the carbon chain where the hydrogen atoms are missing. They count from the the far end, the omega end, and if it's three carbons in, it's an omega-3. If it's six carbons in, it's an omega-6, and there are omega-9s. Now, the omega-3 unsaturated fats, which is omega-3, it's alpha-linolenic acid, is is the omega-3, and linoleic acid is the omega-6. The omega-3s tend to cause your body to create chemicals called prostaglandins that you turn into other chemicals that wind up keeping your blood from clotting. The omega-3s cause your blood to not clot very much, and the omega-6s create factors that cause your blood to clot more. So if you have too many omega-6s, your blood tends to clot too much, and that could lead to heart attacks and strokes. The omega-3s tend to make your blood not clot, so that would counteract that, which is a good thing. If you have too much omega-6, you want some omega-3, so your blood will clot just enough. Now, having too much omega-3s, like the, the Inuit peoples, the Eskimo peoples, their diet's very high in fish. They have lots of omega-3s. They often die of fatal nosebleeds because their blood will not clot. So you don't want, so too much of a good thing isn't a good thing. It's only a good thing if your diet's too high in the bad thing. So it's good as far as balancing that. But if you get your diet overall low in fat, then it doesn't really matter. It, it's not a health food anymore. And that's, that's the lesson we need to know. You know, you need, you need something according to how bad your diet is to start with. But if you get your diet good, then that thing 
isn't, isn't necessary anymore and it's not a good thing. In the omega-3 series, there are short chain and longer chain omega-3 fatty acids that your body uses. And the fish oils have the longer chain ones already made, whereas in plant foods like flax seeds and walnuts and canola oil, you have the shorter chain omega-3s and your body has to make the longer chain ones from that. And apparently some people have some difficulty making those longer chain ones. But what makes it hard for the body to make those longer chain omega-3s is having too much omega-6s that interferes with that process. So if you get your omega-6 levels down by getting your fat intake, the omega-6s are things like corn oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, which are the common oils we use. So if you're eating lots of french fries and potato chips, then you're going to have a hard time making those long chain omega-3s from the short chain ones. But if you get your fat intake low, then there's not a problem there. So the idea, so you don't need the fish oils unless your diet's really lousy to begin with. Human beings have evolved eating a high carbohydrate diet. We can adapt to other diets, but anyone that tells you that it's healthier for your body to burn fats or burn protein doesn't know basic nutrition. Now, you, you might need a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat in cir certain circumstances, but you don't need it to burn as calories. You might need it to use for other functions in the body, but once you force your body to burn those things for energy, you're going to have waste products that your body has a hard time getting rid of. And that's, that's the bottom line of why a low-carb diet is... Is, is, is lunacy, basically. I mean, it is not a normal thing for human beings to have to run on something other than carbohydrates. We just not, don't burn those things cleanly. Um, I'm interested in the dangers of homogenization and wondered if you could point me to, to a source for that. There, there was a book called Don't Drink Your Milk okay. by Dr. Frank Oski, O-S-K-I. Uh, he was from the uh, Syracuse um, Upstate Medical Center. You wound up as chief of pediatrics at uh, Johns Hopkins. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Which was really amazing because you yeah. blasted the dairy industry. Right, yeah. I thought they could hide them away somewhere and nobody could find them. Drinking rice milk and soy milk. I'm not a big fan of soy. Soybeans are an anomaly among the beans. Most beans are about 5 to 10% fat, and soybeans are about 35% fat. Most beans are about 25% protein, and soybeans are about 35% protein. So they're much higher in fat and slightly higher in protein than other beans. We really don't need all that, that fat and protein in our diets. So I'm not a big fan of pushing soy. There's a lot of controversy out now whether soy is something that, you know, a little bit of soy seems to help prevent breast cancer. A lot of soy seems to make it worse. And I don't really believe that there's, soy has a corner on the market of, of anything. So that anything you can get from soy, you can get from other beans, you can get from other plant foods. The question is whether or not you need to make a milk from anything. Now, you can make a milk. The definition of a milk is any fatty substance suspended in a watery substance. So you can make a milk from any whole grain, any nut, any seed. You can make sunflower seed milk or almond milk or rice milk or corn milk if you want to. Thank you so much, George. Let's give him a warm. <laughs> This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.